Chapter 25 Jelly Going 188 kilometres in 36 hours works out at slightly over 5 kilometres an hour. That's about normal walking pace, but you had to stop to eat and drink, to check you weren't veering off an overgrown footpath in the middle of the night, and when the pain got so bad that you couldn't take another step. It wasn't just James and Kerry's legs that hurt from the walking. Their whole bodies ached with tiredness. Precautions went out of the window. Sweaty and covered in insect bites, there wasn't time to put on dry clothes or insect repellent. Their canteens were empty. They didn't have time to stop and collect rainwater, so they had to drink water trapped on giant palms and leaves. James and Kerry dumped most stuff and carried one light pack between them, with nothing in it but a torch, compass and maps. They reached the final checkpoint less than half an hour before the deadline. As they staggered towards a wooden building, Gabrielle and Shaquille ran out and gave them fresh water. Oh, we were getting worried about you two, Shaquille said. You cut it pretty close. The building was locked, but there was a tap on the outside. Kerry filled a rusty bucket, threw half at James, and poured the rest over her head. The trainees were too tired to do anything but crash out on the shady side of the building, waiting for the instructors to turn up. I hope we don't get malaria, James said, scratching the bites on his neck. It's not a malaria zone, Gabriel said, matter-of-factly. What makes you say that? Kerry asked. I knew we were going to the jungle and they didn't give us malaria tablets before we left, Gabriel said. That made me think. The night we were in the hotel, I sweet-talked the guy behind the front desk and he let me use the internet. No malaria in this part of Malaysia. Smart thinking, Kerry said. You could have told us. I told James in the helicopter before the drop, Gabrielle said. Same time I told Shaquille. You didn't, James said defensively. She told both of us. I saw you nod, Shaquille said. Oh, James said. Well, it was noisy. I thought you were saying good luck, so I nodded. Kerry punched James on the arm. Dumbo, Kerry said. You know how much time we could have saved not changing clothes so often? And I was worried to death we were going to get sick. I'm sorry, James said. There's no need to start hitting me. <laughs> Idiot, Kerry laughed. I can't wait to get you in that dojo. What? James asked. Remember our deal after you stomped on my hand? The day after training stops, I get to fight you in the dojo. I thought you were joking, James said. Kerry shook her head. The others were all laughing. <laughs> oh, she'll mash you, Connor said. Can we watch? Who says you're both going to make it through training? Mo asked. It's a four-day course, and it's only the morning of the fourth day. I bet the instructors will have something else up their sleeves. The instructors led them inside. The trainees each had a chair with two buckets in front of it. Speaks covered their eyes with a mask. Smoke tied their ankles to the frame of the chair. Welcome to the ultimate test, Large said. Before we can make you six tired little bunnies into operatives, we need to be sure you can cope with the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Number eight, what do you think is the worst thing that can happen on a mission? We could be killed, Kerry said. Death would be easy by comparison, Large said. I was thinking about torture. What happens if you're captured on a mission? You know something, and some people will do anything to get that information from you. Don't expect mercy because you're children. They'll still slice your toes off, rip out your fingernails or teeth, wire you up and blast those sweet little bodies with a thousand volts of electricity. We hope it never happens to any of you, but we have to know you can take the pain if it does. This test will show us if you've got guts. It will last one hour. You each have two buckets in front of you. Miss Smoke is placing a jellyfish in the buckets to your left. Its tentacles have hundreds of microscopic spikes. Each one packs a dose of poison. A few minutes after contact, your skin will start to burn. Within 10 minutes, the pain is extreme. 
A few years ago, an operative jumped a fence, misjudged the jump, and ended up with a metal railing stuck in her back. Afterwards, she said it was less painful than this test. The bucket on your right contains an antidote to the poison. Within a few seconds of touching the antidote, the pain will begin to decrease. After two minutes, the pain will be almost gone. James felt his head being grabbed. Open wide, Smoke said. Smoke shoved a rubber plug into James's mouth. It was held in with an elastic strap that wrapped around the back of his head. You are being given mouth guards, Large continued, because it is not unknown for people in extreme pain to bite off their tongues. You will each place your hands in the bucket, knuckles touching the bottom, for 30 seconds. The jellyfish will grab you. You will feel nothing at first. You will have to tolerate the pain for one hour. Anyone placing their hands in the antidote before one hour has elapsed has failed the entire course. Due to the toxicity of the poison, you may not retake the test. Any questions? None of the trainees could talk with the plugs in their mouths. Okay then, put your hands in the bucket. James leant forward, feeling blindly for the bucket. He thought he'd had the measure of training, but this was scary. What if the pain was so bad he couldn't help sticking his hands in the antidote? 99 days of training for nothing. The water was tepid. He felt something light and rubbery wrap itself around his wrists. Take them out, Large said. If the jellyfish sticks, slide it off gently. James lifted his hands and pushed off the gripping tentacles. He sat up straight and waited for the pain to start. Two minutes, Large said. It should start hurting soon. James's hands started feeling hot. Sweat was running down his forehead, building up along the rim of the eye mask. He didn't wipe it off in case it spread the poison to his face. Five minutes, Large said. The heat in James's hands was gone. He wondered if he'd imagined it. Kerry sounded like she was struggling with her mouth guard. It looked like the pain had got to her sooner. Ten minutes. You all seem to be holding up quite well. But I can see some twisted faces, Large said. Kerry shouted out. What would be the point of an animal stinging you if it didn't hurt straight away? Large ran over to Kerry. Get that guard back in now. James could hear Kerry squealing as they shoved the plug back in her mouth. The next person who spits out their guard has to go two hours without touching the antidote, Large shouted. Kerry had made James think. There still wasn't any pain from the jellyfish, and what Kerry said made sense. What good would an animal sting do if it only hurt its enemy after it had been eaten or attacked? Fifteen minutes, Large said. Two hours without the antidote? Gabrielle shouted. <laughs> Why not make it ten? Tell you what, I'll stick my head in the bucket. James couldn't see the commotion, but heard water running and a plastic bucket rolling across the floor. This is totally bogus, Kerry said calmly. James was sure it was a trick now. He pulled down his eye mask. Kerry had plucked a harmless white squid out of her bucket and was holding it up for inspection. James took off his mouth guard. Okay, people, Large said. Glad you all enjoyed my little joke. Don't forget to untie your ankles before you stand up. Kerry was looking at James with a massive grin. Were you scared? James asked. I thought it was a trick, Kerry said. Why put the eye masks on us unless it was fake? That never occurred to me, James said. I was too scared to think straight. Look under your seat, Kerry said. Something had been put under everyone's chair while they were blindfolded. James undid his ankles and picked up the present. It was grey. He unfurled it and looked at the winged baby sitting on the globe and the letters cherub. Beauty, James shouted. Kerry was already putting her t-shirt on. James pulled off his blue shirt for the last time. When his smiling head popped through the neck hole, Large was standing in front of him holding out his hand. James shook it. Congratulations, James, Mr. Large said. You two worked well together. 
It was the first nice thing James had heard him say. Chapter 26. Back. You weren't supposed to wear cherub uniform off campus for security reasons, but James wore his grey shirt all the way home, hidden under his tracksuit. He woke up on the plane and peeked down his chest to make sure it wasn't a dream. Kerry was asleep in the next seat. James could see the grey tail of her cherub shirt hanging out the back of her jeans. Everyone was in a good mood. Even the instructors, who got a three-week holiday before the next batch started training. Kerry stopped acting tough and surprised James by turning into a normal 11-year-old girl. She told James she couldn't wait until her nails and hair grew back. She even bought a pen and card in the airport gift shop and got everyone to sign it for the instructors. James told her he thought it was dumb. He remembered that Large had been happy to get them thrown off the course to win a bet. It might be Large's job to make trainees suffer, but he seemed to enjoy it as well. The van from the airport left them at the training building. The few operatives picked a few things up from their lockers and changed out of their casual travel clothes into uniform. James kept one of the filthy blue shirts with the number 7 on as a memento. Kerry was holding out a key. Help me move my stuff? Kerry asked. Where to? James asked. The main building. Red shirts live in the junior block. The instructors wanted them all out of the training area fast so they could get home. Callum was waiting for his twin outside the training compound. His arm was out of the sling. James felt sorry for Callum having to start training again. James gave him a friendly shove. You'll get there, James said. No worries. Connor put his arm around his brother. Kerry was running ahead, excited. Come on, James! James went after her to the junior block. He hadn't been there before. It was the middle of the morning, so everyone was in class. Kerry's room had Kitty's furniture, a plastic desk, bunk beds, and a big wooden trunk with my toys painted on the side. The wardrobe had a green teddy on the doors. What a divine room, James said, trying not to laugh. Shut your pie hole, Kerry said, and carry. She had packed everything before training started. You must have been confident, James said. If I failed this time, I was going to leave Cherub. You don't have to become an agent if you don't want to. Where do you go if you leave? James asked. They send you to a boarding school. In the holidays, you stay with a foster family. You really would have left? I promised myself, Carrie said. That's why I got so upset on Christmas Day when you got us in trouble. James stayed quiet. He didn't want the conversation straying towards their agreement to fight in the dojo. They packed Carrie's stuff onto one of the electric buggies that staff used around campus. Where's your new room? James asked. Kerry showed him the number on her key ring. Sixth floor, James said. Same as me. We're practically neighbours. They walked back to Kerry's old room and did a final check to make sure nothing was left behind. Kerry had tears streaking down her face. What? James asked. This has been my room since I was seven, Kerry sobbed. I'll miss it. James didn't know where to look. Kerry, the rooms in the main building are about 50 times cooler. You've got your own bathroom and computer and everything. I know, but still, Kerry sobbed. Give over, James said. Can I drive the buggy? I've never done it before. The buggy was overloaded with Kerry's stuff and felt like it might tip over on a bump. The bell had gone for a lesson change. Kids were going between the buildings. A few of Kerry's friends stopped the buggy and congratulated them on passing basic. Amy burst out of the door. Hey! she shouted. James hit the brake. Congratulations! Amy said, leaning onto the buggy and hugging both of them. You taught James to swim, didn't you, Amy? Kerry asked. Yes, Amy said. What's with all this? Kerry asked flapping her arms about in a wobbly front crawl. I don't swim like that, James said peevishly. Amy and Kerry both laughed. 
I only had three weeks to teach him, Amy said. He's getting more lessons. Amy copied Kerry's impression of James's swimming, and they both laughed even harder. James would happily have thumped them, only they could both easily batter him. Anyway, James, Amy said, I've been looking for you everywhere. I've got something to show you. What? James sulked. James, I'm sorry, Amy said. I'm your teacher, so I shouldn't laugh at you. I promise I'll cheer you up if you come with me. James climbed out of the buggy. Where to? You look really fit, James, Amy said. James wasn't sure if she was saying it to make him feel better. Are you okay to move that stuff on your own? Amy asked Kerry. Kerry nodded. Someone will help. Amy led James back towards the junior building. What is this? James asked. I wasn't sure you'd make it through training first time, Amy said. I'm impressed. James smiled. Another three or four compliments, and I'll forgive you for what you said about my swimming. They walked into the education block in the junior building. It looked like any ordinary primary school, with little kids' paintings on the walls and plasticine models on the window ledges. Amy stopped by a classroom door. There, Amy said. What is this? James said. Can't you just tell me? Amy pointed at the door. Have a look. James stuck his face up to the glass. Inside, ten kids sat on the floor chanting phrases in Spanish. The red shirts wore the same uniform as everyone else, along with trainers instead of boots. See it? Amy asked. No, he said impatiently. I don't even know what I'm looking for. Then it hit James like a bomb. Shit, he said, grinning. He knocked on the classroom door and walked in. Shit, James said again, loudly, in front of the teacher and the kids. The Spanish teacher looked furious. My sister, James said. He couldn't think of anything else to say and stood with his mouth open. Excuse our interruption, miss, Amy said calmly. Uh, this is Lauren's brother, James. He's just finished basic training and was wondering if you could excuse her. The teacher flicked her hand at Lauren. Go on, just this once. Lauren scrambled up from the carpet and jumped into James's arms. She was heavy. James stumbled back a couple of paces before he got his balance. Hola, hermano grande, Lauren said, grinning. What? James asked. It's Spanish. Lauren said. It means, hello, big brother. Amy had a lesson to go to. Lauren walked James to her room. I can't believe this, James said, grinning uncontrollably. The best he'd hoped for was being able to see Lauren a couple of times a month. Having her walking along in front of him in a cherub uniform was too much to take in. Lauren's room was like Kerry's old one, except everything was newer. I can't believe this, James said again, slumping onto a beanbag. I just cannot believe this. Lauren laughed. <laughs> so, you're pleased to see me? She got cokes out of her fridge and threw one at James. I mean, how? I mean, James giggled. Why are you here? Because Ron punched me in the face, Lauren said. He did what? James said, shocked. Punched me. I had massive black eyes. That asshole! James shouted, kicking out at the wall. They never should have let him look after you. I knew something like that would happen. Lauren squeezed up next to James on the beanbag. I hate Ron's guts, Lauren said. Mrs. Reed asked what happened to my eyes when I went to school the next day. You told her the truth? James asked. Yeah, she got the police. They saw all the smuggled cigarettes when they went around to arrest him, so they busted him for that as well. James laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, serves him right. I got taken to Nebraska House, Lauren said. Nobody could find where you'd gone. I got really upset. I thought I was never going to see you again. So how long did it take them to find me? James asked. I was at Nebraska House three days. Fourth day I woke up here. James laughed. <laughs> Freaks you out, doesn't it? 
They wouldn't let me speak to you. Mac took me to see you, though. I watched you and that Chinese girl doing karate. <laughs> she was killing you. It was so funny. Did you have to do the tests to get in? Uh, no, Lauren said. They're only if you're older and you're going straight into training. Oh, that's so jammy, James said. The tests half killed me. Lauren whacked him across the arm. Leave my hair alone. James was winding it around his fingertips. She hated him doing that. Sorry, he said. Never even realised I was doing it. I'm on a special program, Lauren said. Loads of running, swimming, karate and stuff. So I'm really fit when I start basic training. You're 10 this year, aren't you? James said. Lauren nodded. September. I'm trying not to think about basic training. But you think it's cool here, don't you? James asked. You're happy? It's superb, Lauren said. There's always loads to do. Did I tell you they took us skiing? I got this bruise on my ass the size of a CD. James laughed. <laughs> I can't imagine you on skis. And you want the best news? What? They found drugs and tons of stolen stuff in Ron's flat. Guess how long they put him in prison for? James shrugged. Five years? Lauren pointed a finger at the ceiling. James grinned. Seven years? Nine, Lauren said. James punched the air. Chapter 27. Routine. They had a week off after training finished. James went to check out Kerry's room now she'd unpacked. He wasn't happy. My new timetable is mental, James said. Six hours of lessons every day, two hours homework a night, and two hours of lessons on Saturday morning. That's 44 hours a week of schoolwork. So, Kerry said, what did you do at your old school? 25 hours at school and a few hours homework, which I never did. There's no way I'm doing all that homework. Better get used to scrubbing floors then, Kerry said. For not doing homework? Yep. Or cleaning out the kitchen, mowing lawns, wiping windows. Repeat offenders get toilets and changing rooms. The reason you do all those lessons is you miss loads when you're on missions and you have to catch up. They're not all lessons anyway. Some of them are sport and teaching and stuff. That's the other thing, James said. I've got to teach maths to little kids. All grey and dark shirt kids have to teach. It gives you a sense of responsibility. Amy teaches swimming. Bruce teaches martial arts. I've got to do Spanish with the five and six year olds. I'm really looking forward to it. James slumped on Kerry's bed. You sound exactly like Meryl Spencer, my handler. I can't believe you're happy about all this work. It's not much more than I had as a red shirt. Oh, I'd wish I'd never come here. Oh, stop being a drama queen, Kerry said. Cherub gives you a great education and a cool place to live. When you leave here, you'll speak two or three languages, have qualifications coming out of your ears, and be set for life. Think where you'd be now if you hadn't come here. Okay, James said. My life was down the toilet. But I hate school. It's so boring I want to smash my head up against the wall half the time. <laughs> You're lazy, James. You want to sit in your room with your stupid PlayStation going blip blip all day. You said yourself you were going to end up in prison the way you were carrying on. If you get bored in a classroom, how would you like 18 hours a day in a cell? And take those filthy boots off my bed before I bust your head open. James put his feet down. PlayStation is not a waste of time, he said. You want the best reason why you should work hard? What? Lauren. She loves you. If you do good, she'll do good. If you muck up and get thrown out, she'll have to make a choice between staying with you and staying at Cherub. Oh, stop being right, James said. Everyone in this place is clever, level-headed, and I'm always wrong. I hate all of you. Kerry started laughing. It's not funny, James said, starting to smile. Kerry sat beside him on the bed. You'll get used to it here, James. You're right about Lauren, James said. I have to think about her. Kerry moved a bit closer and rested her head on James's shoulder. 
Beneath that dumb exterior, you're a good person, Kerry said. Thanks, James said. So are you. James put his arm around Kerry's shoulders. It felt like the natural thing to do, but two seconds after he did it, his brain was spinning. What did this mean? Did he want Kerry to be his girlfriend? Or was it just that they'd been through so much together in training? He'd showered with her and slept next to her, but until training ended, James had barely noticed that Kerry was a girl. Not a dream girl like Amy, but not bad either. He thought about kissing her cheek, but chickened out. The room looks nice, James said, scratching for something to say. All your pictures and stuff? I'll have to get some. My walls are white. I was thinking, Kerry said, we should renegotiate our deal. James had avoided Kerry for two days, hoping she'd forget. How? he asked. Friday night, Kerry said. Take me to the cinema. I pick the movie. You pay the bus fare, the cinema tickets, hot dogs, popcorn, Pepsi, and whatever else I want. That's going to be easily 20 quid for the two of us, James said. That kid you're friendly with, Bruce. What about him? He broke his leg once, Kerry said. When we were eight. Yeah, he said he broke it in nine places. Oh, he exaggerates. I only broke it in seven places. You? James said. Snapped it like a twig. Kicked him in the head for luck. Okay, James said. Cinema. My treat. Kyle arrived back from a mission Friday morning with sunburn and a sackload of fake designer gear. James followed Kyle into his room. It was freakishly neat. Even inside the wardrobe, Kyle's clothes were all in dry cleaner bags, above a row of boots and trainers with shoe trees in them. Philippines, Kyle said. I'm back in Max Good Books. What happened? James asked. Confidential. Here. These were supposed to make you feel better when you got kicked out of training. Kyle tossed over a pair of fake Ray-Ban sunglasses. James slipped them on and posed in the mirror. Oh, these are cool. Cheers, James said. Everyone thought I'd fail. You would have, Kyle said. If you hadn't got Kerry as a partner, Large would have chewed you up in a week. You know Kerry? James asked. Bruce does. He said you had a chance once he found out Kerry was your partner. She cost me 10 quid. You bet against me getting through training? No offence, James, but you're a spoiled brat and a total whiner. I thought I'd make an easy tenor. Thanks, James said. Good to know who your friends are. You want to buy a fake Rolex watch? Kyle asked. Same as the real thing. Four quid each. The whole crowd went to the cinema Friday night. Bruce, Kyle, Kerry, Callum, Connor, James, Lauren and a few other kids. James was happy being part of a big group, all messing about and slagging each other off. The film was a 12. The rest of them could pass for 12, but they had to smuggle Lauren through the emergency exit. James worried about what would happen with him and Kerry, especially with everyone else watching. He sat down. Kerry sat with one of her girlfriends a few seats away. James was relieved, but disappointed as well. The more he thought about it, the more he realised how much he liked her. Four days into his timetable, James realised he could live with it. In his old life, he'd always got up late, sat in class mucking about all day, then come home and either play PlayStation, watch TV, or hung out on the estate with his friends. Most of the time he was bored. The routine at Cherub was hard, but it never got dull. You weren't allowed to slack off in lessons. Every class had 10 kids or fewer, which meant as soon as you stopped working, the teacher was on your back, asking what the problem was. Pupils were picked by ability, not age. Some classes, like James's advanced maths group, had kids who were 15 and 16. His Spanish, Russian and self-defence classes were with 6 to 9 year olds. Punishments were psycho if you got out of line. James swore in history and got a 10-hour shift repainting the lines in the staff car park. Next day, his palms and knees were blistered from crawling around on tarmac. Most days had a PE session. After training, 
James was really fit. Two hours running around felt like a warm-up. They started with circuit training inside the gym. The second half was always a game of football or rugby. James liked it best when they played girls versus boys, which usually went a bit mad, with insane tackles and punch-ups breaking out everywhere. What the girls lacked in strength, they made up for with cunning and gang tactics. Boys always scored most goals, the girls edged the carnage. After lessons, James got an hour's rest before dinner. Then it was a scramble to do homework, before rushing off to extra martial arts training. James volunteered because he was ashamed that half the nine-year-olds at Cherub could beat him in a fight. On the nights he didn't have martial arts, he'd go to the junior building and hang out with Lauren. At the end of each day, James was worn out. He'd sit in his bath and watch whatever was on TV through the doorway before drying off and collapsing into bed.